let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 3 down through verse 11. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Excuse me. Verse 10, Peter writes, Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. What things does he mean? Well, those things listed in the preceding verses. Things such as faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity, verses 5, 6, and 7 there. And he tells us in verse 9, But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So he's instructing the believer in how he's supposed to live toward the world around him, given the fact that God has saved him. If God did that for you, don't you owe something to the next guy that's not a believer yet, who needs to be saved? And in so doing, he says, you thus make your calling and election sure. Verse 10, you don't save yourself, but you are confirming the fact that you have been saved between you and God. You're making that fact established and confirmed in your own heart and mind. You're also establishing your testimony in the eyes of an unsaved, unbelieving world around you. And you're showing gratitude and obedience to the one who has saved you. So I've chosen this text, or this passage, uh, to begin a sermon I've uh, titled, Seven Divine Callings. Seven Divine Callings. And I'm going to have you turn to the passages for each point. So move as quickly as you can for time's sake today. God has desires for you, both now and in your future. And there are seven divine callings every man and woman who has turned and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ should keep in mind. First of all, turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8. The book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans 8, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 28 through verse 30. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. First, let me say there's the divine calling to salvation. The divine calling to salvation. God wants all men to be saved. But do they want to be saved? See, your will has to come into line with God's will. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but he is willing that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. This text 
them who are the called, that's not a Calvinistic proof text to divide those God had chosen in eternity past to save uh, from those who he chose to damn. No, uh, there's no such suggestion there at all. But in the New Testament, the believer has a number of different titles. The one who has trusted in Jesus Christ as his savior and God, the forgiver of his sins by Christ, he has a number of different titles. And the Apostle Paul lays uh, several of those out. Uh, Christians in the New Testament are called the church collectively. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32. You and I are called the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. We are called the bride of Christ. Revelation chapters 21, 22. You and I are referred to as the beloved. Romans 1 and verse 7. We are called the elect, Romans 8, verse uh, 33. And here, you and I are referred to as the called. That doesn't mean God chose us in eternity past before our great, 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 great grandparents were ever conceived. But it means once you enter into the body of Jesus Christ by faith, you now possess a number of different titles, as I just tried to list. But God sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross at Calvary. And there God demonstrated his love. There he deposited his love when the Lord Jesus Christ hanged between heaven and earth on behalf of the sinner. And now he calls out to all men, whosoever will may come. I'm glad that on November 5th, 1967, I came. And whatever day it was that you, in the most sincere way of your heart, for the most a definite time in your life ever trusted Jesus Christ to save you. Uh, thank God for that day. But first, there is the divine calling to salvation. Secondly, go, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And two verses here, verses 23 and 24. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 and and 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. This is what I will call the divine calling to sanctification. Since you were saved, God no longer counts you among the unrepentant, the lost, the unbelieving, who are still on their way to hell. Now you are on your way to heaven because of your will coming into line with God's will to save you. Acts 20, verse 32 says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. To sanctify something means to set it apart from the rest of the group. Doctrinally, it's an accomplished fact that God sanctified you. He set you apart from the rest of the world around you. And uh, he has his own purposes for you to fulfill as you are yielded to him in your life as a believer. From the moment you came to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation... Your destiny, your, your destination, was then set. It was fixed. And only in that sense can you use the word predestined. That's another term that Calvinism perverts from the word of God. That uh, your destiny, your destination was decided for you by God. The Bible uh, suggests no such thing. But God could fix the destination. God being outside of time and space can fix the destination and say, this is what's going to happen to anyone who will trust my son. And once you trust him, that's your destination. It's already been uh, uh, waiting for you. But you don't get in on it until the moment you trust him as your savior. So there is the divine calling to sanctification. This leads me to point number three, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And let me read verses 14 through 18. 
2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Not only are you called by God to be sanctified from the world, but and, your, and thus your destination is already been changed. Uh, this is what I would call the divine calling to separation. Separation. Uh, these, past, these previous points, points two and three, seem to almost mesh together in the New Testament. God has sanctified you from the world around you. He separated you. But from day to day, he wants you to keep yourself separated from the world. He's sanctified you or separated you. That's your standing. And nobody can undo that. But your day-to-day -day separation from the, the world in which you live, that's your state, your daily state of affairs. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 says, This is the will of God even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. So as a Christian, let's say as a Christian, or rather as a new believer, you, you were guilty of all kinds of dirty, perverted sins before you got convicted and uh, trusted Christ to save you. Once you trusted Jesus Christ to save you and cleanse you from everything you'd ever done that was unclean and unholy and defined you as a sinner, God cleansed you from that. The blood of Jesus Christ washed you clean from every, every bit of guilt you may have had before that time. Now, he wants you to keep yourself sanctified from fornication. No more dirty jokes, no more dirty magazines, no more dirty pictures or everything else that, that the world throws at you. Everything uh, that corrupts your morals, everything that corrupts your virtue, everything that corrupts your speech and your hearing, and your eyesight, and your sense of humor, and your hobbies, and your pastimes, and your recreation, and every other thing you possess, those things are supposed to be kept clean as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're to live a clean life, a life that's above reproach, because you represent one whose life was impeccable. You represent one whose mouth never uttered something unkind, or something that was untrue. You're, you represent one who is without sin and without fault, one whose virtue was beyond compare. It's hard to wrap our minds around the, the purity and the perfection and the fact that the Lord Jesus was undefiled in every respect. And as such, you and I are called to represent him, to live for him. It's hard to wrap our minds around everything the Lord Jesus Christ is. But it's nevertheless true and if you've called upon him and named his name as your savior and trusted him as the one whose death uh, was for your sake, God wants you to live a clean life as his ambassador, to bring others to Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. First Peter 1, verse 15. And he said in our opening text, uh, in verse 3, God hath called us unto glory and virtue. So God calls you and I to separation as well as sanctification. Fourthly, if you will, go to the book of 1 John, the epistle of 1 John, chapter 3. 1 John, chapter 3. And let me point out what the Apostle John says in 1 John 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, 
and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, or when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. In the Old Testament, the angels were called the sons of God. Genesis 6, Genesis 1, or Job 1, Job 2, Job 38. Only four places. But none of them were ever born again, like you and I were, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. None of them were ever forgiven of their sins, nor were they given a chance to be. When many of them sinned, according to Jude, verse 6, the Bible, it says, God hath reserved them into everlasting, under everlasting chains, under darkness, waiting for future judgment. It gives new meaning to John 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But he tells us here, we just can't see it yet. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. This might seem like some far out, wild, crazy, heret heretical teaching only because you've never been taught it before. Only because you've never read much of the Bible before. That's your problem. You start reading the Bible and believe every word you're reading, you start learning things. I had an older man that I worked with years ago. He said, never be afraid to talk to older people because you learn stuff. That's the way he phrased it. You learn stuff. And if you'd get your nose in the Bible and begin reading it and believe every word there is, is there by God's will, it's there on purpose. This is what God wants you to see. These are the vocabulary words he wants you to read and to know and to memorize. These are the words he wants you to compare this verse with that verse and put them together and learn his doctrines. If you begin reading your Bible like that, you'd come to certain conclusions that are undeniable. And it seems that your destination and my destination, uh, now being called sons of God by the new birth, part of our future is to be a replacement for those angels which fell in the first rebellion. Power to become, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Wrap your mind around that if you can. But he tells us here, you and I just can't see it yet. This is the divine calling to sonship. To sonship. Point number five, if you will, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. John, chapter 15. And John 15, verse 16. John, chapter 15, and verse 16. Christ said, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. Not only are there divine callings to salvation, to sanctification, to separation, to sonship, but fifthly, here's a divine calling to service. A divine calling to service. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. I'm sorry, that's Titus 3, 5. Someone start Ephesians 2, 8 for me. I know you know it. All right. Thank you. I had a mental block for a moment. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But notice verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So a divine calling to service, you're, 
you don't do the saving, God does the saving. You should find something to do for the glory of God and the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and set about to do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about uh, one watering, another plant, or one planter, planteth, one watereth, but God giveth the increase. If your job is a soul winner, you know what? One soul winner doesn't do it all, all by himself. It's very rarely that one person can talk to an unbeliever and lead them all the way to a prayer of salvation and conversion to Jesus Christ all by themselves. Everyone comes to the Lord Jesus because of everything that's gone before. The thing they saw uh, in the news, the thing their mother, father told them, the thing they heard someone say at work, some testimony a Christian before them gave, some sermon they sat through and listened to and actually gave some consideration. to. All of these things work together. And then sometimes you're fortunate to be right there when they're, that seed is ready to spring forth to new life. So one planteth, another watereth, but God giveth the increase when it comes to winning souls to Jesus Christ. But find something through which you can honor God and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and set about to do it. I heard a guy say, I want to be an example to others, even if it's just an example of how not to do it. Well, I don't want to show up being an example of how not to do it. Every one of us is going to make some mistake. We're going to stick our foot in our mouth. I pity the person who's so uh, sensitive, they'll take offense at something they heard rather than the, the sum total of everything you're trying to convey to them. That happens a lot. You and I are living in a prissy, sissy, sissified world, you know, snowflake generation and all of that stuff. Everybody needs their comfort goat to give them, you know, uh, aid and support and make them feel better when they've got their feelings hurt. Ah, get out of here, you know. <laughs> stay home, stay indoors, don't go out and drive a car, don't operate any machinery because you might hurt yourself with it. You really, really, the world has gone crazy. And I, as an American, I love my country and I'm proud of my country. I'm very fortunate to have been born and raised here. But I don't like seeing my country leading the charge uh, toward the Antichrist and toward pure insanity. Albert Einstein said uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different result. So I'll give him credit for that. Um, the idea that if we just confiscate everyone's money and let the government decide who should receive it in return, they'll, they'll spread it around evenly. Yeah, right. They've never done it before. Why would they do it now? Why would they start now? That's insanity. It's like the idea that the government's going to protect you by disarming you. How does that work? Let's uh, celebrate your freedom of speech by telling you what you can't say. Yeah. <laughs> you and I live in crazy times. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. But, but you and I are to be faithful in the service of Jesus Christ, no matter what it may be. Point number six, if you will, run to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. I'm going to try to move along here for time's sake. Romans 13. And let me read verses 1 through 5. Romans 13 and verses 1 through 5. It says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must need be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. This is the divine calling to subjection. 
Everyone else, uh, rather, everyone has someone else that they are in subjection to or they are uh, accountable to, whether it's your boss at work, your teacher at school, your landlord, um, or any number of other authorities over you. Whether it's the children subjection to their mother and father, the wife in subjection to her husband, the husband in subjection to Jesus Christ one day, the church in uh, subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ, under the leadership of the preachers or the pastors and teachers God puts in place. But whether it's the California Highway Patrol, the local police department, whether it's the FBI, or even the Border Patrol. I don't think anyone here has to worry about that, do you? Hopefully not. But you and I are to be in subjection to the authorities over us. The Bible calls them the ministers of God here in verse 4, believe it or not. They're said to be the ministers of God to execute wrath upon the disobedient. When you find your place in a local church, you try to discern what your gifts and your talents may be in a home, and you are in subjection to the authority over you, then you can avoid God's wrath because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're avoiding any punishment that comes to those who are disobedient. And then you can proceed with a clear conscience as well, verse 5 would suggest. So you and I are to be in subjection to the authorities. You know, I was reviewing this uh, a little while ago, and I thought, why does that sound so familiar? It seems like I heard a sermon like this. And I, couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on it. If it was somebody else I had caught on the Internet or on the radio sermon, that I realized, oh, I preached a sermon with almost some of these same, with, with some of these same points about six months ago on finding the will of God. <laughs> and some of these uh, scriptures will overlap, so forgive me for that. But I think God wanted us to review this today. And point number seven, my last point, I'm going to ask you to have you to go to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Acts 14, and let me read verses 19 down through 22. Acts 14, verses 19 through 22. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, and to Iconium, and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. God's divine callings are to salvation, sanctification, separation, um, sonship, service, and, here, and subjection. And also I call this the divine calling to suffering. Divine calling to suffering. Nobody wants that. Everyone wants their life to be trouble-free and worry-free. But if you've ever seen something that you desired and you wanted to purchase it, then there's a small little twinge of worry. Do I have enough money on me right now to buy it? Or do I have enough money in my bank account to cover it? Because then all of a sudden, all the other bills and obligations you have rush through your mind at the same time. It's uh, marvelous how quickly you and I can process all the details in our brains. But we can. And you're that, little, that little decision, whether I can or can't buy that right now, uh, all of that can be uh, decided and negotiated in your own mind in a split second. But... No one wants to suffer for something. Nobody wants to go through life as a Christian and endure hardship. The Lord Jesus was the most perfect of all men who have ever come into the world. And they crucified him. They mocked him. They belittled him. They accused him of being illegitimate. They cursed him to his face. 
They, they, the, the religious leaders who should have expected him and seen him and known better stirred up the mobs and the angry crowd to yell, crucify him. If those things could have happened to the most sinless being in the universe, then don't be surprised if they're going to happen to you as his disciple. And don't fret and worry that you're trying, you, you can escape hardship, you can escape hatred and mockery by people who don't love the Lord Jesus. You do the best you can, and every day pray that God gives you the grace to survive and to have a clear and a strong testimony as you go. Paul says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12. Philippians 1.29 states, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Joel Osteen will not be reading these scriptures today from his sports arena in Houston. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 3 says, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. And as I just said a moment ago, Joel Osteen will not be reading that scripture to the 40,000 people gathered in the uh, sports dome church. Not just afflictions or suffering that's common to everybody, but suffering specifically because of your testimony as a believer. If you think that I can become a true believer in Jesus Christ and know that my name is in the book of life and I've been washed clean from the consequence and the guilt of my sin and now I'm headed for heaven by the new birth and uh, nobody will ever take issue with it. Nobody will ever be upset about it if I try to tell them about it. Think again. It doesn't work that way. There's very little hardship and suffering for most Christians here in the United States compared to other places in the world. If you put things in their perspective, you'll realize that the lives we live here in the United States and North America as believers and those who profess the Lord Jesus Christ are relatively problem-free compared to so many other places in the world. You should get down on your knees, on your face, and thank God that you're not living in one of those places. But little cases of persecution and trouble will pop up, incidents here and there from time to time. So there's no sense in trying to avoid it, like a lot of Christians do. Just get ready for it. You know what most Christians do when the cult members come to their house and knock on their door, JWs? They hide behind that curtain, hoping they don't see their shadow inside the window, you know? Shh. Maybe they'll go away. I'll tell you what, it would be a lot of fun, and it actually is a lot of fun, because I've done it. My dad used to do it. I used to witness my dad at, the, at our front door in our house as a boy, is to know how to talk to these people, know exactly which verses you want them to answer for. My grandfather would cheat. I told you his trick. I love my grandpa Leonard. Um, he had a little cheat sheet of verses inside his front door, on the, right on the wall, taped to the wall by the light switch. So he'd stand in there, and they'd be out there on the front porch, and he'd look out of the corner of his eye. He could see exactly which scriptures he wanted to talk about and get them to talk about what he wanted to talk about, not the other way around. If you dominate the conversation, you'll keep their heads spinning for a long time to come. But if you sit there passively and let them take you to the subjects that they want to talk about, you might as well give up. But if you do a little study and preparation and say, next time they come, I'm going to see what happens. And engage them. First of all, they're not expecting you to be aggressive. So you throw them off their game. And my dad was great. He'd say, let me show you something. He'd get their Bible out of their hand. And he'd show them some scriptures to prove the Lord Jesus Christ was Jehovah God. It was glorious to watch. I, I really have to commend him for raising me with that uh, thing to see. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, 
but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. God's called you, a divine, give you a divine calling to suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ. And if it's persecution or, or accusation by someone who doesn't believe, or if it's physical health, physical problems that you could have done without, you take those things with stride. And Ephesians 5 verse 20 says, giving thanks always for all things, not just the good things. And leave the rest up to God. If you take what God gives you faithfully and patiently and seek how you might honor God and glorify Jesus Christ in so doing, then uh, you have fulfilled the calling. You have, you're living up to the calling, I should say, that God put on you. Don't shy away from it. Don't try to run from it. But accept it and say, thank you, God. Uh, give me the strength and the, the courage and the wisdom and the memory to, to get through to the other side with my faith intact.